Okay, so then what we're gonna do here too? Okay, I, I like I like that that place setting, and I want first of all, let's start with one of the key Ballywicks here that you bring, Professor K, and obviously, and I want to connect it with one of your key Ballywicks, which is bringing democracy to foreign policy. But can you start? And I and I don't even want to get into we've we've had people can go into the archives and I think there's a great debate that maybe we'll get to a little bit in the post game about exceptionalism or non exceptionalism and all of this. We can get to that. That's fine. But there's actually an empirical point here, which is that America, in addition to being all of the things that I outlined in the opening commentary and having, you know, being run by reactionaries, including right now, also has a very, you know, there's also other elements of American history that are very progressive. Even as an example, the civil rights movement was a radical movement. It wasn't just a movement for vital civic reform. It was also, it was across the board. Uh, and then going back to Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine fits clearly in the radical tradition. He is Can the you, godfather of American radicals. Okay, so maybe talk about that. How did Ronald Reagan specifically, as a microcosm of how the right has totally distorted our progressive history, and use how they abused yeah. Thomas Paine's legacy? Yeah, well, I can start with the specific story of Ronald Reagan yeah. grabbing hold of Thomas yeah, Paine. Yeah, please, do that. I was fascinated by this. So it, in, in 1980, when he was running for president on the Republic, he was the, and won the Republican nomination, he was quoting Thomas Paine on the campaign trail. The, and it was, what's amazing about it is that liberal Democrats, ever since Roosevelt, had rediscovered Thomas Paine and quoted him. But they quoted, these are the times that try men's souls. They, they quoted something having to do with, you know, in the Cold War, these are these times, right? But Reagan did something that Democrats had, had, not, had not done. The only left-leaning figure that I really come across in the post-war period who actually embraced the line I'm about to cite is Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And that line is, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. And I came to that, to, to, to King's using the line after my book was published, so it's not in the book. And it was a great thrill to come across it. So the thing is, Reagan grabbed hold of it, and then I had this question in my head. Now I'm gonna talk, I know you don't wanna talk about archives, and I'm not gonna talk about archives, but it was, to me, I am a historian, and I had to find out where the fuck no, please talk right? about Where that. Where the yeah, fuck Ronald great. Reagan would ever come upon Thomas Paine and do that? And I right. actually had a, my theories included this. D during World War II, when he was still a, an FDR Democrat, there was a novel published by Howard Fast, mm. right. Citizen Paine, okay? Right. And it became a bestseller. It was a really big bestseller in 1943. And I think it was in the wake of that bestselling, uh, th that book appearing, that Fast became a member of the Communist Party. But the, the interesting thing is, is that Reagan was very, very interested in popular history. Everyone I spoke to who knew Reagan told me that he had a great, he would love, he loved reading history, not academic So he history. was sort of like the way Tony Soprano would watch the History Channel with a Sunday. He I guess, like, He yeah. was a great general. Yeah, that, that, that type of thing. But, but, but right. that's probably, that was the first theory I had. Right. Um, and I have w kind of regretted that I didn't have the money to fly out to California and check his library, okay? But then the other, th the next thing was in the 1960s, he actually did, he narrated a, like a record on American history, especially with sort of American era revolutionary history. And I, I did listen to that and there's no mention of Thomas Paine, so it wasn't there. But the third theory I, I had was that somebody inserted it, okay, into his life. So here's the, re and the reason I say that is, can I introduce Barry Goldwater into this? Of course. Kidding? Barry Goldwater's Sorry. 1964 convention address, accepting the Republican nomination, he, he, the one they prepared for him, he didn't like. So they called in a guy named Harry Jaffa. You know the name Harry yeah, Jaffa? Yeah, it's course, one yeah. of the sort of, yeah. the neocons went in different directions. So he's one of those kind of guys. He just, he died not too long ago at, a, at an old age. He was head of the godfather of the Claremont Institute in Southern California. Oh, okay. That's so actually I, a pretty, that's a pretty well-known right-wing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the that. The shocking thing about the Claremont, just for the record, is that they've gone pro-Trump, which most neocons... Are, are the never Trumpsters, I guess? Is that what I guess. Are? I think I, 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 you will find, uh, along with Eric Erickson and Glenn Beck, that that whole category is going to basically disappear as we get into 2020. Yeah, sorry, I'm using There's no the market left yeah, for no, those guys. Right. You know, and even from is spending half of his time 
indirectly saying, well, you know, Trump's rude, but you should embrace his most obscene policies. Yeah. So and David that Brooks whole endorsed, kind. David Brooks endorsed reparations. Right. Well, that's the opposite. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but yes. But having said that, so but, anyhow, so Goldwater, yeah. they called in this guy, Harry Joffa. That whole hustle is disappearing. Who was then a political science professor at Ohio State, Ohio University. And right. he, he, so he wrote the speech which said, um, I'm forgetting the line. What's the famous line? Help me out here. The Thomas Paine line. Extremism in the defense, oh, extremism of, liberty defense is of liberty is no liberty vice. Is no vice. Okay? Right, right, right. Now, that's not exact. So I, I interviewed Jaffa because I could hear the echo from a, something Paine had written. And he said, well, throw he, an egg at him. I was, <laughs> I, I was, was I, I would do it on the phone. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, fair enough. Then, then you're exempt. But what's funny it's was sort it, of it like was, you know, it was one of my it's, like when, it's like in the '80s with Iran. You know, you saw Salman Rushdie. Yeah, well, and you might get it was one of my that friends was, who was, actually worked at Weekly joke. Standard. <laughs> one of my friends who worked at Weekly Standard yes. was the guy who introduced me to Java. Java didn't know my politics. Right. Like, you wouldn't have talked to me otherwise. Right. So the thing is, I. Um, and he said to me that he was looking for quotes, and he picked up Bartlett's like ninth. <laughs> <laughs> it was like as That's simple great. That's as such that. Such an Oxum's razor. That was the Barry. Yeah, so great. the Barry Goldwater's famous line, right? Is right. that okay? So now, where's Reagan come into this? So I interviewed all of Reagan's speechwriters and the people who literally were his campaign people. Right. And one guy in particular, I think his name was Peter Hanrahan, who was very high up, going back to the California days, and he told me that. Reagan really loved popular history. And I think he was reading one of the cons very conservative magazines when they'd go on a plane. And he would pick out quotes because he had the stump speech, but he would change things from city to city. And they were usually sitting first class. And he came upon this quote some point probably in the late eight, my years are off, 70s. Right. And just it, he loved it because he figured this was a way of sort of, you know, giving it to the left. Right. He was going to be the one to quote, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. And he used the most famously used it in the convention speech of 1980 when he accepted the nomination. And he really drove the historical line on that night because he quoted Lincoln. Well, he quoted Payne, Lincoln and Roosevelt. Wow. Yeah. The yeah. Balls. And Gary the Will, gall. not Gary Will, George Will. George Will was outraged that he would quote Payne because a conservative is supposed to quote Burke, right. not Payne. <laughs> Okay, you can imagine the Roosevelt people were outraged because right. he pulled, he lifted Roosevelt's, you know, line without any reference to the meaning of it. Right. Um, and Lincoln, he might have had some claim as a Republican, but as Roosevelt said back in 1930, the Republicans haven't wanted to haven't wanted to be near Lincoln in years. Let's make him one of our own. Right. You've just watched a Michael Brooks show video, and you can watch all of our full main live shows every Tuesday night at around 7 p.m. Eastern time, and subscribe to get all of the clips you want. We're covering the globe. We're focusing on international relations, the intellectual dark web. We're having fun. We're doing deep dives with a lot of amazing guests. Of course, become a patron for the whole thing at patreon.com slash TMBS, or subscribe to this YouTube channel and help us keep growing and get that content out there. Subscribe below.